And now, on with the show. Hello and thank you for joining us. This is our Bible class for Sunday, September the 13th. We're in the middle of a study of John's Gospel. We left off in John chapter 11. And we really kind of left off even in the middle of a story in John chapter 11. Jesus had gotten word that Lazarus, his good friend, was sick. And we talked some last week about the first half of chapter 11. Jesus waits two more days. He talks to the disciples about some lessons that they can learn and, and some things that they need to pay close attention to because they have Jesus with them right now, and that won't always be the case. And finally, Jesus says, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes I wasn't there, but let's go now. And Thomas had said, let's go also that we may die with him. And we talked a little bit about Thomas. Verse 17 says, So when Jesus came, he found out that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Jesus makes that journey to, to Bethany, and, and he goes and he finds out now that Jesus that Lazarus had already been dead. We're not told an awful lot, but as it is common in culture, people surrounded Mary and Martha. There was lots of folks with them. The only thing we know for sure is that Jesus remained beyond the Jordan for two days and that when he shows up, Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Scholars debate all kinds of things, but we're really just not told exactly how the timing went. The four days might be important because we know later on there was a rabbinic belief that the soul hovered over the body of a dead person for three days. But, but the, the Mishnah says uh, that as soon as it sees an appearance change, that is, as soon as it sees decomposition begin, the soul leaves for good because then it knows that death has truly happened. So by four days, everyone would have known that Lazarus was dead and not coming back. John doesn't tell us much about the timing of the journey or the distance or anything else, but he does tell us in verse 18, Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. It's just a two-mile distance. Jesus really is almost to Jerusalem. He is right in the backyard of those leading Jews there in Jerusalem. And because it was so close, and this is such a prominent family, lots of people made the trip just from Jerusalem down to Bethany, to comfort Mary and Martha. Again, it speaks to, to how well known this family is. And so as Jesus is coming, verse 20, Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary, Mary was sitting in the house. Martha is the, this is what we see over and over again. Martha is the practical, the busy one. As soon as she hears Jesus is coming, she leaves and we're going to see she actually meets him outside of town. Mary was the pensive one. Literally, she's sitting there. That was the, the standard position to receive guests in your home was you would be seated like that. And, and so Mary was the one who, who stayed at home. Martha was the one who jumped up and, and ran off. And verse 21 says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. In some ways, those words must have, have cut Jesus to the heart. They're a statement of faith. Lord, I know you had the power to heal his sickness while he was alive. If you had just been here, no doubt Lazarus would still be alive. Mary or Martha goes on in verse 22. She says, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. We, we know that Martha is not saying that I think you can raise him from the dead because a little while later in verse 39, she's going to express disbelief about that. She seems to simply be saying, this hasn't dimmed my faith in you. Even now, I still know that, that you are the Son of God. I still know that, that God has favor upon you. The death of her brother Lazarus had not shattered her faith in Jesus as the Son of God. She knew that he had the power to heal sickness, but perhaps she, she didn't have any idea, it seems, that, that he could raise the dead. And so Jesus says to her, verse 23, your brother will rise again. Your brother's going to live again. And what Martha says next tells us a little bit about Jewish culture. Verse 24, Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. There were two leading schools of thought amongst the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And one of the big points of disagreement between them was whether there was life after death. The Pharisees believed that there was a resurrection, that we would live for eternity. The Sadducees believed that once you died in this life, it was all over. You ceased to exist, and there was no afterlife. Martha clearly identifies herself with the Pharisees on this. 
She She's taking a position, whether we know it or not, she's taking a side in a political debate. It shows the influence that the Pharisees had, especially with the people. The Sadducees were powerful there in the temple and with the priests and that the, the rich and the elite. But the Pharisees were popular with the people, and Martha clearly identifies with the Pharisees. It is interesting, Jesus himself says that at least when it comes to their views on the afterlife, the Pharisees are correct, and the Sadducees don't really understand the Scripture. And so Jesus has said, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know, I know, I know. We're talking about the end of time, and yes, he'll live again. That doesn't give her much comfort in the moment. And Jesus wants to redirect her away from some theological debate about the end of time. And so in verse 25, he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus makes one of those great I am statements. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And we have to look at that a little bit. Are those two the same thing? To say I am the resurrection... It literally means that, that there is going to be a resurrection, that I am the one who can bring Lazarus back to life. And to say I am the life in this context seems to me not only can I bring Lazarus back to life, I can make sure that you can live for all eternity to share in that resurrection life forever. So when Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life, he says I can bring Lazarus back and I can give him a, a quality of life. It's Jesus in John 10 who'd said, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And now this seems to be, again, a reference to an abundant life in this life and eternal life in the next one. And Jesus says there's a condition on that, though. He is the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in him, whoever puts their faith in him, even if he dies, he can live. And whoever lives in that way, whoever puts their faith in him and lives in Jesus, will never die. And then he asks Martha such a critical question. Do you believe this? It's a test of Martha's faith. Martha, I've told you something profound. I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And Martha seems to respond immediately. I love Martha's faith here. She may be the practical, busy one. She may be the one who's always worried about what's going on now. But, but don't diminish. Don't take away from her faith. Because she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe. Literally, it's a perfect tense verb. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. She says, I, I believe, absolutely. And she responds immediately with a statement of faith. And, and so while she may be that, that busy one, she was a woman of deep faith. And, and she didn't understand any more than the disciples did all about resurrection and what Jesus meant by that. They wouldn't understand that until after he was raised from the dead. But she does say something really important. I, I have come to believe. It's a perfect tense verb. It means I've arrived at this point and I'm still there. I have faith in you. And, and her faith, her confession of faith has three parts to it. She says, first of all, I've come to believe that you are the Christ. To say that Jesus was the Christ is the one, to say that he was the one that was expected by the Jews, the one spoken of in the Old Testament, the one that all the prophecies were about. He is the fulfillment of God's plan that was foretold by the prophets. You are the Christ. And you are, number two, the Son of God. To say that, that he was the Son of God acknowledges, just like John the Baptist and Nathaniel did, that he's more than a human being. You're more than a man. You are the Son of God. You and God are, are, are in sync with one another. You are similar to one another. You are family. In fact, John is going to say that all these signs we see in, the, in his gospel are all designed to convince us so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Martha's there. I believe you're the Christ. I believe you're the Son of God. And I believe you are the one who is to come into the world. You're the expected one. I believe that you are God's Son from heaven. But I also believe you are physically here and present. And you are here to do God's will. Martha's three affirmations of, of Christ give us this exalted view of exactly who Jesus is. And they demonstrate deep faith. And when she'd said these things, this concludes Martha's time with Jesus. When she'd said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. Jesus is still wanting to meet with Mary. Jesus is on the outskirts of Bethany. He hasn't come into town yet. Perhaps to avoid the crowds, Martha goes back and secretly calls her sister. Says, hey, Jesus is out of town, outside the town. He's asking for you. 
And so Martha, verse 29, or Mary, verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the, into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Jesus waited for her out there. Again, perhaps to avoid the crowd, but it doesn't seem to do any good, because verse 31 says, Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She's going to the tomb to weep there. Mary comes to Jesus. The crowd is following, and there's certainly a large crowd as they continue their consoling. And verse 32 says, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She says something very similar to what Martha said. Both the sisters are, are suffering in their grief, and perhaps there is somewhat of a, an expression of disappointment. Jesus, if you'd just been here, you could have stopped this. Again, we see in both their statements no hint that they believe Jesus can raise the dead. That seemed to be beyond his powers. And, and yet, they, they come, and, and she falls down. She just says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Even among poor families in first century Jerusalem, it was traditional that you would, have, you would pay at least two flute players and one professional wailing woman. Amongst wealthier families, you would have even more. So there were professional mourners. Their job was simply to go and weep loudly at a funeral. And there were musicians whose job it was to play sad music to help everybody weep loudly at a funeral. There's quite the procession here. And when Jesus sees Mary weeping, and then he sees all the, the folks who'd come with her, it said he groaned in his spirit. Your Bible may say he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. The word there literally means to be angry. There's an anger that Jesus has. And it means to express displeasure. And so maybe we're right to ask, what was it that Jesus was upset about? The other word there indicates that, that he was shaking with emotion. He feels so strongly about this that, that he, he shook as a result of it. Jesus certainly isn't troubled by the weeping of Mary or the weeping of the others. Jesus can handle our tears. Jesus himself will shed tears in just a moment. But he groans in his spirit and is troubled. Perhaps he's angry at death. As he sees all the devastation that death has caused, that Lazarus' death has caused, the enemy who holds all human beings captive to uncleanness and shame, and he realizes all that Satan is doing in this moment, he's angry about that. He certainly moved with compassion toward those. And he said, Where have you laid him? Verse 34. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus simply asked, Where is Lazarus? And he's told, Come and see. Verse 35 is often known as simply the shortest verse in the Bible. Every kindergarten and first and second grade kid who needs to memorize Bible verses has always looked to John 11:35 as a savior to get one verse in easy. Jesus wept. It's a shame that's what we know that verse for because the content of the verse is powerful. Jesus comes to the edge of the tomb and he sees the sisters weeping and he sees the crowd weeping. And he knows that Lazarus is dead, but he knows what he's about to do. And he stops to weep anyway. Jesus cares about what makes us cry. And when we weep, he weeps with us. The emotion that is conveyed there is powerful. So much so that verse 35 says Jesus wept. And verse 36 says, then the Jews said, see how he loved him. They could see the emotion that was present when Jesus cried along with the sisters and everyone else. As Jesus entered into their grief with them, even though he knew what was about to happen, he stopped to be with them in that moment, and he wept with them so much so that it was obvious to everyone around how much he loved them. But there's always some critics too, some cynics. So verse 37, some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? They're expressing the same thought that Mary and Martha had expressed. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You know, Jesus healed so many people. Couldn't he have healed Lazarus? They indicate a few false ideas here. First off, they say, you know what? If Jesus heals strangers, surely he would have healed his friends. But Jesus' miracles weren't for the benefit of his friends. It wasn't that you wanted to get in good with Jesus because he could get you a get-out-of-the-tomb-free card. Jesus' miracles were for the purpose of confirming the word. We're going to see that in just a moment of bringing about faith. 
And so they ask, well, you know, if Jesus could do all this, surely he would have taken care of his friends. This is the one he loved. Look at how hard he's crying. So they began to question his power. Verse 38 says, Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, perhaps aware of their thoughts, aware of what they're thinking, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. It was a popular way to bury folks, especially rich people. Sometimes they would take a cave that already existed and cut a stone to cover the front of it. Other times they would actually hew out a cave from the rock cliffs and then have a stone that would cover it. Regardless, Lazarus had a tomb and he'd been laid in it and been there for four days. And Jesus says, roll the stone away. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead four days. She's simply acknowledging what, what everyone else knows. It was common in Palestine to, to bury someone as soon as they died. Both Ananias and Sapphira, when they die, are buried immediately. The Jews in, in Palestine did not practice embalming or any other types of preservation of the body. And, and so they tended to bury the body very quickly. Likely Lazarus had been dead for four days and been in the tomb for four days because it would have happened that quickly. And so she says, Jesus, there, there's going to be a stench. She's trying to politely tell him, you don't want to see this. You, you, don't want to, you don't want us to do this. But Jesus comforts her and he said in verse 40, did I, not say to you that if, did, it, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Jesus comforts her and he says, you know what? I, there, there's faith that you need to have here. Although everybody's going to see what Jesus does, he says there's a message that only the faithful will have. If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Jesus is bringing comfort to Martha in this moment. In verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes. And Jesus is about to pray. We, don't, we aren't told who it was that took away the stone. Perhaps it was some of the friends. They come together. And they take that stone away from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus begins to pray. And he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus utters a, a simple prayer, but it's meaningful for lots of reasons. First off, he says, Father. He doesn't say, Our Father, like he teaches the disciples to pray. He just says, Father. He indicates yet again that he and God are one. He, he shows that relationship and he says, Father. And then he says, I thank you that you have heard me. He uses a past tense to say, God, you've already heard this prayer. You have already speak. He is so confident of what God's going to do. He can speak about it in the past tense. And third, he speaks of the, the union of the Father. He says, I know that you always hear me. I, I know our relationship, God. You always hear my prayers. I'm confident in that. And then fourth, he says, I offer this prayer of thanksgiving for everyone around. I want the folks standing around to hear what I say because I want them to believe that you sent me. Again, the purpose of a miracle. It's not just to, to bring his friend back from the dead. It is that the folks who are standing around may come to believe that you had sent me. And so verse 43, when he'd said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Again, the idea of a loud voice. It's not so Lazarus can hear him. It's so the crowd can hear him. Everyone can hear. The, the wizards and the, the practicers of magic of the day tended to mutter their spells. Isaiah speaks of the wizards who muttered under their breath, but Jesus cries out with a loud voice. There's no magic incantation here. This is the power of God. Lazarus, come forth. The miracle was instantaneous. It was complete. It was incontestable. It says, he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Immediately, Lazarus comes out from the grave and Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Your Bible might say, unbind and set free. Take those grave clothes off him. They would have wrapped him pretty tightly. And so you can almost picture Lazarus like a mummy, if you would, uh, coming out. And here is Lazarus who a moment before was a rotting corpse and now he's back to being a living being. The Lazarus that everyone know, Jesus knew. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. And that ends the story. John doesn't go into a lot of detail about how it all worked out. He simply shows us the authority that Jesus has even over death. When we pick up our story next week, we'll look at the effect that this has on, on the Jews and, and what they believe about all of this. We're going to see them reach a very interesting conclusion about what they need to do. 
But as we close today, I, I want us to look at, at three people in the story. Because Lazarus was dead, but Jesus had hope. And Jesus says, you know what, I, I want to share that. With his disciples, first of all, he said, let's go, let's see the glory of God. With Mary and Martha, he said, if you believe, you'll see the glory of God. And while you and I aren't dead, we do find ourselves in a lot of dead ends sometimes. And, and it's, we struggle to have hope. And maybe even in these times especially, you have wrestled with, with holding on to your hope. And really this story is about a resurrection of hope. And, and that's the message behind all of it. So there's a, a lot of folks that we could look at, but let's look at three. First is Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. And Thomas is dead in his doubts. Remember all the way back in verse 16, Thomas, who's called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let's go that we may die with him, whether it's sarcasm or fatalism. Thomas says, this won't end well. I know it's going to be bad. Thomas is dead in his doubts. Maybe there's a time that you prayed and things didn't work out like you wanted. And you begin to wonder, God, are you even there? Did you even hear my prayer? Maybe you grew up with a really simple faith and you went to college and some professor said Christians are really dumb for believing in Jesus. The Bible's a fairy tale. And it kind of made sense the way that professor explained it. And a little doubt crept in. Maybe something bad happened to you or your family or a friend and you wondered how God could let that happen. And a little doubt crept in. And doubt can paralyze us. Doubt can kill our faith. And suddenly you're dead in doubt. And suddenly you feel like, Thomas, you know what? Nothing ever works. It always turns out bad. I mean, I'll hang with Jesus, but it's going to kill me. And Thomas is dead in his doubts. Thomas says, we'll keep doing this till we die, but it's not going to end up good. That's dead in doubt. Or maybe we're like Mary. Mary's dead in her discouragement. Word comes that Jesus is coming to the house. And Martha gets up and she leaves right away. Mary just stays sitting there. You can almost see she's wondering, why bother? Lazarus is dead. If you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But you weren't here. Lazarus did die. And there's nothing anybody can do. Maybe you get that feeling nothing's ever going to change. It's never going to get any better. I'll always have my problems. I'll always have my struggles. It's just who I am. It's never going to improve. I'll always be depressed. I'll always lose my temper. I'll always settle for less than the ideal. I'll put on some good clothes and put on a good face and come to church. But inside, my faith is dead. From discouragement or maybe you're like Martha Martha was dead in the delay because Jesus took too long it was four days and and Jesus said all right Martha says if you'd been here my brother wouldn't have died you took too long and maybe you felt like you know what God you took too long things didn't go according to my plan and, and I've had to wait too long I was waiting for the right person to marry, and it took too long. Uh, a married couple who says, we waited to start a family, and it took too long. You're praying for God to bring someone to repentance and salvation, and you think it's taking too long. But the story of Lazarus shows us that God's delays are not God's denials. The fact that God waits does not mean that he says no. He's still in charge, and he still has a plan that he may be glorified. Martha says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. There is faith even then. Even though we're dead in doubt, discouragement, or delay, even now, and maybe what you need is an even now moment. So as we study the story of Lazarus, I just wanted to stop and share that with you. An even now moment. I know that God is still there. God can give strength even when it feels impossible. Jesus says, your brother will rise, Martha. Do you believe that? It's easy to find ourselves dead, dead in doubt, dead in disease, dead in discouragement, dead in divorce, dead in depression, dead in death itself, dead in debt, dead in delay. All kinds of things that, that can kill our hope and leave us dead on the inside. We feel trapped, but Jesus is the one who rolls the stone away and calls us to come out and live again. And, and that really is the promise of God. As we study this story of Lazarus, I, I hope that that encourages your faith. We'll pick up next week in verse 45 of John chapter 11 and finish out that chapter. Thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Let's pray as we close. Oh God, you are the giver of life. Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. Thank you for the promises that are written for us in Scripture. Thank you for the story of Lazarus, and we can see there is hope even in those darkest of times. And God, I pray for each and every person who is watching this Bible class. 
that you would be the one who gives them hope, who shines a light in their darkness, that, that says, come forth from all of that and be free from that darkness. God, I pray that we would put our faith in you no matter what. Thank you for the promises you give us. Help us to walk in faith every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.